Hello to anyone who is watching this. This video is going to be very chill, quite low production. It's literally just the scenes of my trip to Tintisfield, which is a gothic Victorian house. And literally, I'm just going to be coming on a little bit to give you some history, some reflections of my trip. And then I'm just going to play some nice music and you can just sit down and relax. It's just one of those type of videos that you're supposed to take slow and, you know, enjoy with a cup of coffee. Um, I was going to say bundle up, but I forget now that it's getting spring. Spring in England and it's actually getting warm, surprisingly enough. But these these shots are from last summer, though they do look like... Then I'm sure there's nothing as much as has changed in terms of appearance. But this was uh, last August, I believe. Uh, but I've taken a while to record this. But I will love you and leave you and return a little bit here and there when I have some information to tell you about the, the family and the building itself. Uh, so obviously here I'm just arriving and just walking around to uh, around the back of the house towards towards the main entrance. So enjoy and I'll be back soon. who lived and built Tintersfield was the Gibbs family headed by William Gibbs who made his fortune in his business Anthony Gibbs and Sons. Um, he, he bought the property in 1843 because it was originally part of the Tint family estate which is where obviously Tintersfield comes from. The house itself was completed in 1863 at a cost of £70,000 which is obviously quite a lot for that time. Um, it has around 106 rooms, 26 main bedrooms, and 46 including servants' quarters. So obviously they had a lot of servants there, and it's 44, uh, 40,000 square feet. So it is a, a quite big house. The patriarch William Gibbs, as I said, earned his money from the company Anthony Gibbs and Sons, which was a guano company. So guano is literally a fertilizer, like like bird crap basically so not the most glamorous way to earn loads of money and um, some people call him sort of the richest non-nobleman in England at the time. The Gibbs's principal home was actually in High Park Gardens in London, but obviously having a country seat is a way for the middle classes to really ascend into upper middle class spaces and, you know, prove your worth and your um, status. They were both quite involved with the Oxford movement, which is basically a movement of high church members in the Church of England. Um, and it's kind of a sort of like Anglo-Catholicism, so that's why there's a building that uh, will be shown very soon that's of the chapel, um, and that's a sort of an Anglo-Catholic chapel. The effect of their religion, of course, is not only shown as the chapel, which I'm showing you here, but also the rest of the house. Um, so 
the choice of gothic was definitely um, inspired by this movie because obviously gothic is it almost the house almost looks like a church that sort of architecture with spires and and that sort of detailing So as I said, the style of the building is Gothic and it's built of two types of bath stone, which is that kind of cream stone um, that you'll see in a moment. Uh, the journalist Simon Jenkins describes the combination of the architecture and those materials as severe, which I'm not 100% sure of what he means, but I kind of get him because I do have to say, as I said earlier, I think grey stone would just have been better. There's something that... The cream stone to me is very, very Georgian. Like I think of Bath, um, I think of um, you know those kind of classical buildings. So I don't know if Gothic and cream stone necessarily goes super, super well. And it's quite, quite a warm cream as well. It's not like a cool cream of a uh, cathedral. My reason for coming to Tittersfield is because I'd actually used the house as inspiration for one of the great houses in one of my novels um, called Maud Edivane. It's set in the 1840s, which I know is a little bit earlier to when the house was fully completed, but it was only a loose inspiration. Like, for instance, I actually hadn't seen that many pictures of the inside, and as you saw earlier, I think the, the Great Hall has got to be my favourite part of the house, and what I thought was really amazing is when I was in there, uh, there was a piano playing, like just, you know, the one of the automatic ones, so there was not anyone on the piano. And it was just like, having that little bit of ambiance was just brilliant, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, unfortunately, the house called Highbrook in my, in my novel doesn't appear for very long. It's kind of mentioned throughout, because it's one of the main characters of that, and then we go to the, their house towards the end. But not for very long, unfortunately. But it was a little bit surreal, especially being in the garden, because that's where one of the main scenes, I say main scenes, but one of the more important scenes of that little later section happens in the garden. Uh, so it was very strange to see that. But yeah, it is, it is a lovely house and I, I found it to be very, very different because I'm used to going around more Georgian and classical homes and going to a Georgian house, a Gothic one, felt very, very different. So it's definitely pushed me to go to more Gothic Victorian houses because it feels so, so different. Because sometimes when you go around classical houses, I'm sure people who love going around country houses know, they kind of meld into each other. Some of the rooms and layouts are very, very similar. And because I think like asymmetrical design and just different ideas and different concepts became more popular in the Victorian era, they feel much more distinct. But yeah, it was really nice to come and obviously see that because it inspired my books.
but yeah in terms of history beyond that so William Gibbs in typical middle-class Victorian fashion had quite a large family so he had seven children and the house passed to in 1875 upon his death in the house Anthony Gibbs then it passed again to George Abraham Gibbs the first Baron of Raxall um, in 1907 and then to Ursula Lady Raxall in 1931 and uh, as was typical of lots of country houses during the wars um, housing different people so they housed Clifton High School and the US Army Medical Corps uh, there actually it, is, it gives me very bright as revisited but obviously that book is just kind of commenting on that on that phenomenon of sort of armies um, using those houses or passing by them etc etc the final Gibbs that lived and owned the property was Richard Gibbs, the second Baron Raxall, who died in 2001. And then afterwards, there was a big campaign to get the National Trust to buy the property, but obviously it was very expensive. So there seemed to be this whole Save Tintersfield campaign in 2002, and then it was eventually bought. And obviously it's now open today. You can go visit it. And obviously I went to go visit it, and this is just me leaving the property. So if you're ever in the area, as I said, it's in the southwest of England in Somerset, please do go. Um, I did find it very enjoyable. And hopefully they have a few more rooms open next time because that's the only my only complaint really. But it was it was quite a fun day. I did enjoy it. <laughs>